Good evening and welcome to this Decision 2018 Treasurer Debate. I'm political reporter Max Reese and I will be moderating tonight's discussion. First, let me introduce you to our candidates, Republican Thad Gray, a private equity money manager, and Democrat Sean Wooden, former president of the Hartford City Council. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Max. Thank you. The rules for the evening are simple. Each candidate will have one minute for opening and closing statements and two minutes to answer each question. They will also have the opportunity to respond to comments made about them by the other candidate. We will let some conversations flow, but we also want to make sure we get to as many topics as we can throughout tonight's debate during this hour. And with that, Mr. Wooden, your opening statement. Thank you. Our state faces significant challenges and significant opportunities. And I'm running for state treasurer because my unique private sector and public sector experience for almost three decades prepares me to meet these challenges head on. As an investment attorney, I've worked with public pension funds for 20 years. I've also served in local and state government. And I'm ready to bring that experience to the voters of Connecticut to serve. As a city council president in Hartford, I stepped up to serve in my hometown in a time of financial distress. In my first uh, few years on the council, I helped close a $50 million budget deficit. I held the line on property tax increases. I challenged a mayor, a former mayor of my own party, to cut wasteful spending out of government, and I'm proud of that service and what I've done. As state treasurer, I will continue to seek to maximize returns and minimize risk, and I will also invest in the right priorities, jobs, education, and infrastructure to help grow our economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Wooden. Mr. Gray. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to Connecticut tonight about the critical financial issues that our state faces. Um, <clears throat> I am running for state treasurer for one reason and one reason only, to restore financial stability to the state that I grew up in and love. I have 35 years of executive, proven executive leadership in the area of investments and debt management, two areas of experience that the state treasurer must have every day in their job in Hartford. You know, as I do, that experience matters in the office of state treasurer. It's time for Connecticut to get serious about its problems. We all know that Hartford politicians, like my opponent, have failed us. On November 6th, Connecticut has a clear choice. <clears throat> Between someone on whose watch Hartford slid towards bankruptcy and bailout, or me, someone who will lead Connecticut in a different direction, someone who has the experience for the job of state treasurer. Thank you very much. And Mr. Gray, first question to you. We're going to start with the number one issue we found, according to numerous polls, that concerns voters, taxes. Currently, of course, the state treasurer doesn't make specific tax policy, but they have a big influence in managing the money in the state's bank account, and that can impact spending and revenue. How do you plan on making the state and this office a better steward of the people's money? Sure. So... Um I think that uh, uh, the, the state treasurer has both direct and indirect responsibilities in their job. Uh, the direct responsibilities are to manage the assets of the pension funds and to uh, oversee the issuance of the state's debt. Uh, the uh, pension fund uh, performance uh, over the last several decades has been very, very weak below the median. So one of the, one of the first things I want to do is to improve the, the performance of our pension funds. Uh, and the studies that I've seen show our pension fund performance not only below the median, but actually near the bottom 25 percent. Uh, secondly, the, the, the indirect responsibilities of the job, I think, are to serve as the state's fiscal conscience. So the treasurer sits on approximately 20 different boards and commissions. On every one of those different boards and commissions, such as the Bond Commission and the MARB, the treasurer needs to be the fiscal conscience of our state. Mr. Wood. Yeah, I think, I think your question is with respect to taxes in the state and how the state treasurer can help in that. And one of the critical things I've talked about is the treasurer investing in the right priorities and being focused on the right priorities for our state to help grow our state's economy. Ultimately, I mean, we have a problem with a shrinking economy. We have a problem with an exodus of uh, people wanting to live here. 
And so that's something that the state treasurer can do in several respects, uh, including through uh, Connecticut Innovations, which is our venture capital arm of the state. And I've talked extensively about a Grow Connecticut, Invest in Connecticut jobs program. We have to, over a period of time, seek to grow our way uh, to a greater place in this state. And that's something that I'm very interested in doing. Additionally to that, um, you know, I actually have experience of, of being a fiscal watchdog. And you just look at the Hartford Current uh, reporting over the last, my entire tenure in the Hartford City Council, there is no one more fiscally responsible in terms of engaging on issues of taxes, engaging on issues of our pension system, which I fought to make sure our pension system, which is a critical uh, element of the job of the state treasurer, to make sure, unlike the state of Connecticut, which for 50 years has been bipartisan failure, uh, on the part of politicians to actually pay attention and focus on that issue. So state employees' pension system is only 38% funded. Uh, due to the work of me and some others, the city of Hartford pension system, a financially troubled city, no doubt. Um, it was financially troubled at least a decade or two before I came in the office, and it still is today. But the pension system, as a result of my fiscal stewardship, is 74% funded. Can I respond like to, to respond. That? One yeah, if you, if you want to talk about fiscal responsibility, there, there were numerous examples of lack of fiscal, fiscal responsibility in Hartford while Mr. Wooden was president of the Hartford City Council between 2012 and 2016. Hartford actually experienced 11 consecutive bond downgrades between 2012 and when Mr. Wooden left the City Council. Uh, within 10 months of his departure from the City Council, uh, the legislator, legislature had to uh, vote uh, $80 million of assistance over a two-year period of time to, to basically uh, get Hartford back on its feet. Uh, the following uh, year, 2018, uh, the, the state entered into a $550 million bailout of the city of Hartford. So how he can talk about fiscal responsibility in Hartford when he was president of the Hartford City Council is really just beyond me. He, he's making Hartford sound like it's Switzerland. But Hartford had a bond rating that was downgraded 11 times, and right at the time when he left office, it was seven notches below junk status. So how he can sit there and talk about fiscal responsibility in Hartford under his tenure, I really, think, just I just don't get I it. Think, one, one minute I, to you, Mr. Wooden. Yeah, I, the, the irony of, of Thad saying that because I was in the city of Hartford serving, rolling up my sleeves, working hard, while he was sitting in a penthouse on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and making money for the rich to get richer. The irony of that contrast to say while I was sitting there, while you were working on Wall Street, while Wall Street devastated millions of lives in this country, I mean, I, I find that ironic. With respect to, let me finish, with respect to the city of Hartford, I absolutely, uh, I, I put money into our, our uh, fund balance and reserve, I cut uh, every budget that was proposed and took expenses out of it. Yeah, Hartford's a poor city. And so when you have the luxury to sit in the cheap seats and to throw shots at it instead of rolling up your sleeves, and I understand you just moved back to Connecticut a year ago and you, and you want to serve, and that's great. I think public service is great. I've been doing it in different fashions for 25 years. Public work is hard, especially in a financially troubled city. One minute to you, Mr. Gray. Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, just to set the record straight, uh, uh, the, the clients that I had at my previous firm, uh, that we had at our previous firm, were all pension fund clients. They were not, we were not helping the rich get richer, as, as, as Mr. Wooden just said. They're not we're, all pension fund clients. Now, that's just They were pension true. funds. Please, please they were please, endowments. Sure. They were foundations. We did not have wealthy individual clients, just to set the record straight. Uh, and, and so the, we were, were actually helping millions of people for, to secure their retirement future. That's what our investments at my old firm did. So for him to sort of say that I was in a penthouse on Fifth Avenue helping the rich get richer, that is a complete and total mischaracterization of my record in the investment business. If, I don't think if it's... I can, if I, okay, if I, if I can sure. follow up on, on, on the city of Hartford, um, while, while, you, while, while you were president of city council, the city did rely in some respects on some one-time revenues. One thing that's been discussed many times is the agreement to, for the state to purchase a parking garage from the city, which was a 17 to $20 million transaction, but then that removed 14. a revenue, sorry, $14 million, but that also removed a revenue stream from the city of Hartford, and it also left a hole in the budget the next year because that purchase doesn't carry forward. How do, how do you discuss 
or at least justify some of those decisions that were made while you sure. were city council president. Sure. And we'll start with this as a new topic, so I'll give you two minutes, yeah. Mr. Wood. Sure, sure, and I'm glad you, you asked that question, right, because this is the type of actual underground experience. You talk about one-time revenue sources. Of course, every government, municipal, state government uses that. That's not sustainable. But does that make it okay? No, 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 no let, but, but let me, but of, of course it's okay if you're trying to make a budget work, right? I mean, if you grew up in a household where you're struggling to, to pay the bills and you got a one-time revenue source, you figure out how to use it and you, you survive, right? And the city of Hartford has been struggling for a long time. That supposed one-time revenue source, what you don't know about it is that the mayor's proposal was to sell the entire parking system. The work that I did with the city council and, in, and had a financial firm come in and do an analysis was to say, we, no, we're not going to sell the entire parking system. We're going to limit it to this. And with respect to that particular garage, the rationale for doing it in part was to help shore up on the state side, right, because the state was taking over it. And, but that is, so somewhat one-time revenue sources actually meet multiple objectives. And that's the case of one of them, right? Okay. Yeah, and, and, and to be more sp precise, talking about the 14 million, it was sold to the uh, Capital Region Development Authority to help shore up the Excel Center's balance sheet. Shoring up the Excel Center's balance sheet was to help the city of Hartford get its annual payment that they failed to make for several years in the area of $2 million because they didn't have the revenues to do so. So the example you give is an actual an example of us being smart about trying to shore up a revenue source that would produce revenue in the coming years for the and, city. And Mr. Gray, because you obviously did not serve in the Hartford City Council, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a different question. Well, he was uh, president, actually. Well, yeah, he, he, right. he, he did indeed. We've been over that. Um, right. Uh, let right. me ask you to, to, to you this way, though. Uh, currently you live in Lakeville. You've yes. lived in Sharon. You lived in a part of the state that does not have a lot in common with a city like Hartford, with a Correct. city like New Haven, with a yeah. city like Waterbury or Stanford. Do you really understand, do you really have an understanding of the issues that those urban centers face from both an investment and a development standpoint, which are integral parts of the treasurer's job? I do. I just spent several hours uh, uh, earlier this week with one of our America's great uh, mayors, uh, Aaron Stewart of New Britain. And uh, we, we talked about uh, what the next state treasurer uh, should be doing to help uh, Connecticut cities. And um, w one of the first things she said to me is, well, first of all, the treasurer has to, to get to know the cities. Uh, no one in her office has seen anyone from the uh, treasury uh, office uh, since she's been in, in power. And that will change under, under my leadership in the, tre in the treasury. Uh, and um, I think that that also ab applies to, to the legislature. A number of uh, 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 legislators that I've gotten to know, uh, who, some of whom sit on the, on the bond commission, they, they don't see the state treasurer either. The, the treasurer needs to reach out to the cities and, and be much more present than the treasurer has been in the past. The treasurer should be sending representatives to, to CCM, that's Connecticut Council on Municipalities meetings, every single meeting. Uh, I will uh, make a point of getting to one of the CCM meetings every year at least, but I'll send uh, a, a delegate to every single meeting. They will report back to me so I know what's on the minds of our municipal leaders around the state. I think there's a, a, an enormous amount of detachment currently uh, uh, between the Treasury and, and, and the, the leaders of our cities, and that concerns me very much. That's one thing I definitely want to change. Let me ask you one question this way, Mr. Gray, if that's all right. Um, one of the biggest criticisms of Connecticut has been that the cities in this state need some kind of help for young people to come in. And here in Connecticut, the state takes on that role of bonding, of yep. taking on that borrowing authority. Do you think that you understand the issues when it comes to development that a city like New Haven or Hartford may need to recruit the next generation of workers, to recruit those next individual industries? Uh, to, to, to a point where you can make those decisions in the treasurer's office, because, of course, Sean Wooden's from the city of Hartford. Yeah. So, do, what, so what, what, do you, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I think the, the, you mentioned bonding, and the, the treasurer sits on, on the bond commission, has a very important yeah. seat on that commission. And I, I think, you know, one of the most important things that we need to do is prioritize our bonding. Uh, we need to, to, to make sure that bonding uh, is prioritized towards capital expenditures, long-term capital expenditures, 20 years or longer. Uh, and that means building and rebuilding schools, building and rebuilding roads and, and hospitals and bridges, 
um, and that the, that the Bond Commission is not used as a sort of a candy store for politicians to come in and, and dispense favors around the state. Uh, but, but clearly, a lot of the money will be and needs to be spent on, on our cities. Uh, I want to see it prioritized in a way uh, that bonding is used for long-term capital projects and, and not, as I said before, for really for political favors. If I can go to you, Mr. Wooden, for this two minutes to you. The role of the Bond Commission when it comes to cities, does perhaps the Bond Commission need to prioritize investment in individual cities? Those places that we've talked many times about need to be those places for young people to move to Connecticut for places to work and live. So, I mean, I think cities are important to the vitality of our state, but I don't necessarily believe there should be prioritization, right, in a sense, just because you're a city, right? There are needs throughout our state, right? When I talk about investing in jobs, growing our economy, education, infrastructure, that's throughout our state. And there are certainly things in cities, um, cities hold unique places, right, centers of commerce in our state. Um, and many people from suburban communities, you know, in the case of Hartford, you know, thousands and thousands of people utilize the city for, for work, for play, uh, every, every day, right? And so they hold a special place. But I think we need to look at bonding and our priorities. And everything we do in terms of the state bond commission should be based on our shared priorities as a state and making those decisions. And I would agree that there's been too much pork over the years, too many special uh, projects. Uh, we may disagree on what's pork and what's special projects, right? Because sometimes, you know, I just spent, you know, the day at a, at a community center, at the Willow uh, Community Center in uh, Waterbury that was built with state bonding money. Right. And the seniors there uh, and the young people after school that utilize that, that's critically important. Oh, would, you, would you like to respond at all, Mr. Gray? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I would. Uh, that uh, you know, I think that one of the important jobs the treasurer plays is to occupy a, a bully pulpit, and, and uh, the bully pulpit on the bond commission is one of the most important uh, bully pulpits the treasurer occupies. I've been very, very outspoken about my disappointment with the bond commission uh, since since I started my campaign. You can see uh, my statements on my website. By contrast, my opponent's website is sort of a policy desert. There's just nothing on there that you can find, and I've actually called on him a number of times to speak up, but I haven't heard anything. Uh, I will, uh, I will um, uh, speak out as state treasurer regardless of which party holds the governor's mansion. I would expect to agree with Bob Stefanowski more often than Ned Lamont, uh, but if I disagree with someone that, something that Bob wants to get through the Bond Commission, I'll, I'll stand up and say it. Um, and so I think that's a very important role for the state treasurer. I will play that role. And I have used the bully pulpit of the, my candidacy throughout my campaign. I think that's in stark contrast to my opponent. Mr. Yes. Wooden, one minute to you. So speaking of stark contrast, my opponent needs to use the bully pulpit of his campaign because he doesn't have a record of public service like I do. You can see, you can read the 2012 to 16, the Hartford Current, oftentimes front page, top of the fold. You can see the fights that I took on. You can see... Uh, when I held the line on taxes, you can see when I put money into our fund balance, you can see that. My opponent does not have that record, so that is a stark contrast. Moreover, my opponent, who claims not to be a politician, has become really, really good at just playing politics during the course of his short tenure of this campaign in public service. I answer to voters. I don't answer to, to every rock that my opponent wants to throw uh, from, from his perch, respond to this, respond to that, because I have a track record of engaging and of delivering, right? It's not rhetoric or empty promises when I say I stood up to make sure our pension fund was fully funded on an annual basis based on <clears throat> actuarial determinations. That's my record. That's my history. Th 30 seconds if you'd like to respond. Well, holding the line on taxes when your mill rate is in the 70s, I think, is, is, is not exactly what I would call an accomplishment. Uh, and, and secondly, if you, if you look at, uh, if you, if you look at, uh, at the, the record of, of Hartford uh, in the four years that Mr. Wooden was president of the city council, it was a disaster. And, and he talks about Wall Street. But actually, <laughs> the bailout of Hartford was, was a windfall for Wall Street. Why is that? Because the Hartford bondholders were the ones who got a windfall. That's right. uh, and, 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 and the bond insurance people 
uh, who were guaranteeing Hartford's debt got a windfall. So it was as a result of, of conditions set under Mr. Wooden's leadership that Wall Street got a windfall, which I find I'm, ironic. I'll give you 30 seconds and yeah, we'll have to move on. I mean, it, it's, it's disappointing that you just became engaged in uh, politics and public service in Connecticut, and you seemingly don't appreciate, my opponent doesn't appreciate the fact that Hartford's been in financial straits for a long time. Right, so that c keep coming back to under Mr. Wooden's leadership, I'm proud that I rolled up my sleeve and I went to work and put my private sector career, which has been very successful, by the way, um, on hold a bit to do that. So I'm, I'm proud of that. And earlier, talk about... That's, that, that's time. I'll, I'll give you okay. five or ten more seconds, Sean. Yeah, this, this reference to you know, agreeing to Bob Stefanowski more, more than he expects to agree with Ned Lamont, I mean, that w shows priorities, right? He agrees with Trump and Trump's policies. He agrees with Bob Stefanowski and Stefanowski's policies, and I don't. And that will be a stark contrast on how we engage in the work of the Treasury. office. I promise we will come back to the Hartford bailout. I promise we will okay. come back to that. Oh, All yes, right. I'd uh, love to come back we, to that. I, that's a promise, uh, okay. Mr. Wooden. Um, uh, I want to get back to part of the role of the Bond Commission, though, because that is such a critical uh, part of the job. And also, this has been a big part of the news for the last right. couple of weeks with a, uh, a with a study on tolls and other investments around the state. Um, does the, uh, this question first goes to Mr. Wooden. Does the state handle too much bonding? Is the overall structure of the state of Connecticut out of whack where the state takes on the debt for local cities and towns when other states around the country have other government entities? In some cases, it's a transportation authority. In some, some cases, it's a county that takes on these kinds of things. Does the state of Connecticut, and the same question will be to you, Mr. Gray, have to start looking at entities like that to smooth out and spread out that debt burden for taxpayers? Yes. Okay. Care, do you care to, care to elaborate? No, I, I think some people, and maybe even my opponent has done this, when they talk about the debt burden, right, and you accurately point out, we put our educational uh, bonding. Everything goes and on the state. Everything goes goes on the state, right? And so the numbers in these comparisons, I mean, sure, does the state borrow too much and for the wrong things? Sometimes, absolutely, right? But the numbers are apples and oranges in terms of the comparisons because a place like New York State, you know, they have a county system for, for the borrowing. And I think we absolutely need to look at our system. Mr. Gray? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I, I, once again, I mean, I think that on the bond commission, what we really need to be doing is prioritizing how we bond, because we have a bond cap, and, and everything that we uh, spend, uh, which is not for capital expenditures, has to come out of some other, some other project, which is a capital expenditure. So that would be my primary role as, as a member of the bond commission. To, uh, to, 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 to really use the bully pulpit to make sure that we are prioritizing our borrowing towards long-term capital projects and not projects that should be prioritized and funded at the local level. And I'll ask you quickly, does the state take on too much of a, of a burden for its individual cities and towns? Um, yes. Yes, I, I think so. Okay. Um, well, well, we'll move on now. We're actually going to go to the MARB board, what, what yep. you mentioned earlier. This is going to be a question first for Mr. Gray. Uh, many of our viewers may not know, the state has a system for dealing with distressed cities and towns known as the Municipal Accountability Review Board, referred to offhand as MARB. It has already taken on responsibilities very recently in places like Hartford and in West Haven. So, Mr. Gray, the question to you, should the state be playing this kind of role in individual cities and towns overseeing finances and overall management? Well, I think actually the MARB board is, is one, of the, one of the positive things that, that came out of the Hartford bailout. And, and so I, I, I do uh, think that, that, uh, that, that the, uh, the, the way it's set up is, is appropriate, uh, that um, uh, we, we, we have four tiers at the moment, uh, as you know. Uh, we have two cities that are in, in tier mm -hmm. three. Uh, and I think that the, 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 it is absolutely an appropriate oversight mechanism. Uh, and if, if we need to reclassify the two cities that are in Tier 3 right now and Tier 4, that, that, that's just something that we have to do to make sure that we give those cities the tools that they need to succeed and so that those cities don't become a permanent burden on the state. That's what the MARB board is there for. 
Uh, so I, I, I do, uh, I do, I, I do think that that's appropriate. Uh, I'll follow up with you. That's right. I'll follow up with you in the yeah. same way, Mr. Wooden. Um, you mentioned earlier during your remarks, there's the, the 20 some odd boards that the treasurer sits yeah. on. How involved would you be in overseeing some of those distressed municipalities as state treasurer? Well, again, it, it would be done through through the MARB board, right. not directly as state right. treasurer. Uh, so I think as one of the 10 people on the MARB board, the state treasurer plays a very important role. Uh, so uh, once again, I mean, I, I think that it's only when the cities get to the point where they're tier three or tier four that the treasurer, as a member of the MARB board, would get deeply engaged. Got it. Uh, Mr. Wooden, question to you. The role of the MARB board, and do you agree with the state kind of interjecting itself into local affairs under specific uh, distress circumstances? I, I do, under specific distress circumstances. The state has done this. There is precedent. I mean, the MAR board is new, yeah. but there is precedent for the state doing this very successfully in places like Waterbury and other places, uh, Bridgeport. And so we have success with doing it, and I think it's appropriate. And to have these different tiers, that's appropriate as well. Uh, do you think, uh, and, and what would your role be as treasurer in the way uh, you connect or interact with those cities or towns that are uh, that that where you now have a say because you're on the mark sure um, the treasurer is not just one of several members the treasurer plays a leadership role within that body of MARB right and so so the interaction I would expect to be to be extensive uh, okay uh, would you like to add anything mr. Graham? no I, I agree with uh, mr. Wooden on that point uh, the, the treasurer needs to uh, punch uh, above uh, his or her weight on every one of these boards. Um, and if, if the treasurer uh, doesn't command more uh, respect than just one vote on a board, that, that's, not, that's failed leadership by the treasurer. So without a doubt, uh, uh, the treasurer needs to be a leading voice on, on every one of these boards and commissions. Uh, we're going to move on now. I promised we'd get back to the Hartford bailout, and I'm, I'm a man of my word. Uh, this question is going to be for, for you, Mr. Wooden. How would you deal specifically with the city of Hartford if you're elected state treasurer? Do you agree with the current level of support the state is providing? And frankly, should the city of Hartford receive this bailout, if you will, from the state? So that decision has already been made by those that currently sit yep. and occupy offices at the state and local level, right? And I don't. With that said, to address the question of, of the bailout, um, yes. First of all, I always correct people, it's a bondholder and a bond insurer bailout, right? I mean, and that is a large reason why the way that this was structured, I do not support. I've been on record throughout the state. I've been asked this question, of course, as a former, you know, I had nothing to do with it, but as a former city council president, no, I do not support the way that this bailout took place. I do not believe it reflected the legislature's intent when it uh, passed the legislation. And so that, that is my issue uh, with it. With that said, uh, that train, as I understand it, has left yeah. the station. Um, Mr. Gray, We Dr. have to uh, make absolutely sure that we don't use the Hartford bailout as a, as a template for, for future uh, uh, municipal distress in, in our state. Uh, and and, and that, that's something that, that I would be uh, adamant about as state treasurer. This was a blank check bailout. One of the worst things about it uh, uh, was that there were no conditions for it. Uh, uh, it was a blank check. And, and you can't just throw money at cities and expect them to solve their problems. So we, we need to make absolutely sure that in, in the future, if there are cities that need municipal assistance, uh, that, that, that we do it in a different way. Um, that's what I would say. Um. We'll, we'll, we'll stick on this for, for, for a little while longer. You both made the point earlier early, early in this debate. The fact is, while, while yes, it, it eased payments off of the city of Hartford, the fact is those are payments going to bondholders. It's not like, that's, it's, it's not like that's, uh, that allows the city to spend on other things. It just says, we're, we're going to do it this way. Do you think that um, if this is looked at as an example for a future city, does this set a precedent moving forward that if you bite off more than you can chew as a municipality, we'll start with Mr. Gray and we'll come back to you, Mr. Wooden, then the state's going to be there to catch you like a, like a net in a trapeze? Well, that's exactly what I said earlier. That's what I'm really concerned about, is that we don't want the Hartford bailout to be a precedent for, for, for what we do going forward. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the good things about the MARB. I think it's there, it, 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 it imposes a structure 
uh, where there's going to be a process for any city that, that, uh, that you know, falls into distress, that, that we have a process in place uh, under the MARB to make sure that it's no longer a, a blank check bailout. Uh, so um, that, that's a critical part of the Treasurer's role. Mr. Wooden? No, I, I mean, I would, I would agree. It's not, it's not going to be a, a precedent. Um, it's just simply the reaction of the legislature, which, which I, I completely understand. Um, that this will not be a precedent going forward. Um, a year or two from now, there might be another city or town. I don't know which one it might be. Um, and they say, Treasurer Wooden, we have $20 million in annual payments that are going to keep going up. And we have a balloon payment coming up in, let's call it, a dozen years. What do you say? What, what is your response to that city or town uh, moving forward? And how do you try to address their fiscal problem? So, and I should have said this earlier, as a, as a matter of philosophy, I think what we are prepared to do for one municipality, we should be prepared as a ma matter of policy, as a state, for any similarly situated municipality, right? So that should be a rule of thumb. And so what, whatever that is. And so with, with that future municipality that comes forward, I think we have to look at the facts and circumstances at the time and understand Right, and this is an important piece of the Hartford. I don't agree with, with the way the Hartford bailout was structured, but we do have to understand the ripple effects of doing something or doing nothing, right? In the case of Hartford, I know that what was happening in the region based on, based on Hartford was, was gonna hurt not only other towns in the region, it was gonna hurt the state. Right. So in that sense, in the state's self-interest, it had to do something. Now, I think the way this was done was wrong, but it had to do something. And so I think with a future municipality, we have to we have to look at one. We got to we got to support our, our local municipalities. Right. We have to expect uh, fiscal accountability uh, from them. Right. So I agree with that. But we've, we've got to support them. That that's what government is, a, is about helping uh, communities. And fundamentally, right, that future town that comes forward, I'm going to figure out how to help them, kind of within the constraints of state government and, and our budget. As a matter of philosophy, and I'll ask this question to you as well, a yes or no question, and you kind of alluded to it. Do you believe that if a city like Hartford or New Haven or Bridgeport or Waterbury catches a cold or gets sick, do you think the other surrounding communities will catch a cold? Yes. I want to give that yes or no question to you, then you can answer the question about uh, the role, what, what happens moving forward. Do you think that if a big city in Connecticut gets sick, then the surrounding communities can catch a cold? I can catch a cold, but I think that, you know, we have pockets uh, of, of the state that are doing much better than, than other pockets of Without the state. Without question. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, in a, a, a city that comes to mind is, is Danbury, uh, which has, you know, set itself apart from, from the rest of the state. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that one of the things is that we have actually very good municipal leadership uh, across our state, except for a, a few of the, of the large cities. Uh, when I see how, how some of the small towns uh, fight every single year to keep their mill rates down, uh, I, I'm encouraged that a lot of cities around the state and, 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 and other municipalities do a very good job of, 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 uh, of, uh, of running themselves. And one of the things that, that I objected to with the Hartford bailout, it was, it was a, a process that rewarded uh, bad behavior and, and punished good behavior. Spreading that debt uh, around to 168 other towns and municipalities from Andover to Wolcott, putting that, uh, that, uh, that burden on the backs of taxpayers as a result unfortunately, a failure of leadership by, by uh, politicians in Hartford like my opponent uh, over the four years that he was in the city council, that was the part about the bailout that I objected to. I'll give you 30 this, seconds to respond. Yeah, to this, this is the same politics speak as usual, right? As po I served for four years, and by all metrics, right, I served well, but my opponent wants to keep saying in four years that I'm responsible for all of the debt of the city of Hartford that accumulated, right? And he says he knows something about debt and debt management. Trust me, that wasn't a four-year issue. That was, well, that, was, that, was, that was a couple of decades in the, in the making. Well, well, and I'll, so, give, I'll give you 30 seconds. Yeah, what I would point out is that when you came into office as president of the city council, Hartford had an investment-grade bond rating. It was a single-A credit. 
by 2017, Hartford's credit was 11 notches below junk. This happened in, in less than five years. Uh, and there were bad deals done in Hartford under your leadership. Yard Goats Park, that, that was actually a windfall for Wall Street plutocrats. And and Dillon Stadium, we know what happened with Dillon Stadium. Two million dollars was paid to to a, a, a sports promoter who had been convicted of embezzlement and had judgments against him in four different states. The city council didn't do its homework when they signed the contract uh, with uh, when, when the city signed its contract with with that person. And there was other money that was stolen from the city right under the nose of the city treasurer. No one shined a light on it. So these are some of so, the things that went on in Hartford that were set the conditions for the bailout. I'll give, yeah, you, two, I'll give you two minutes to respond. Mr. Sure, Lee. sure, sure. Thank you. So in terms of kind of getting the facts straight, right, and I, and I understand you haven't been involved. You haven't been here, and you, you've had another career. But let's talk about these issues. Dillon Stadium, let's start with the fact that city council never approved that project, right? It died when it got to the desk of the city council. Right, one. Two, uh, city council president never supported the project, um, ever. Right, it, three, the city council president, the, the politician you're sitting next to, was the one who actually reported something that looked fishy about the numbers when it came to the city council. Four, this politician that you claim to be sitting next to is the one who called for, because you need accountability at all levels of government, the director of development services to leave his post as a result of that and all of that happened with respect to the yard goats i think it's silly to sit here in 2018 and to and to try to litigate that debate the yard goats project was in a, and is a success it put people to work and it's still not finished it's about and this is about understanding development in a city and developing a whole community in a neighborhood that had nothing but weeds and parking lots for three decades and starting a catalyst in that area, right? All the metrics have proven to be successful in terms of attendance, it's broken records. In terms of spinoff, in terms of the downtown community in the neighborhood, it's uh, met those objectives. In terms of starting new businesses, a hotel that couldn't uh, get financing for years, uh, after that, that hotel is up now and taking customers uh, just two blocks from the stadium. That's what that project was about. And you look at the, whether it's a Hartford Current editorials, talking about the success of the project um, as recently as this past September. These have been successes. And Oh, sorry, well, oh, that's time. I'll give you two minutes. Okay. I'll, I'll give you one more minute to respond. We yeah. can try to eliminate Right. Well, this. He, he's talking of, uh, about successes of Yard, Goat, Yard, Yard Goats uh, Park, but, but let, let me tell you uh, who might have a different view on that. That's the, that's the taxpayers, uh, because this is, this, is a, this is a project uh, that had massive cost overruns. Uh, the current mayor of Hartford had to call in the FBI uh, to, to do an investigation of the cost overruns by a company called Center Plan Development, which, which was the, the, the builder. And, and operating losses every year, 2017, 2018, as far as the eye can see, we've got two to three million dollars. I think the operating loss for 2018 was supposed to be three and a half million dollars. This is on the backs of a city that, that's got budget deficits. So it, it, Yard Goat Stadium may look really pretty and everyone likes baseball on a summer night. I do, I know, I love baseball, but it's not something that the city could afford. And numerous people from Mr. Wooden's own party in Hartford uh, including his primary opponent in the treasurer's race and, and the, his opponent in the state senate race uh, and the uh, 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 president of the Hartford City, uh, 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 the Planning and Zoning Commission at Hartford, the mayor's wife, they all spoke out at the time and they said it was a terrible idea. This, but this, Mr. This, the city council well, run, ran sure. roughshod over the critics of Yard Goats Park and so we now are stuck with it. One minute to you, Mr. Wooden. Again, my opponent simply doesn't understand government and he simply doesn't understand what actually took place. Roughshod, the city council slowed the project down six months for extensive public hearings, brought in an economic, anal uh, economic analyst, Fred Carsonson from the Yukon Center of Economics, who analyzed the project. All the projections have proven to be, to be correct. Uh, you mentioned falsely that 
the president of the, the head of the Planning and Zoning Commission that spoke out and called it terrible. Don't do that to people. Sarah That's, Bronin, I think it, she did. She did not. She In did. fact, her Planning and Zoning Commission had to pr approve it, and they did. And they voted against it at first. They, 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 they absolutely voted I'll, against it. I'll give you 30 more seconds for your time. As well. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank, you. Seconds. thank you. The project could not have been done without their support, okay? And it happened. Right. In 2014, those, they voted against those the, are the facts. Those are the facts. You, you, get, you got somebody to do some research about one vote on something. I get it. You don't understand the project. I get that, and I think the viewers get it as well. And in terms of the taxpayers, you want to talk about everyone. Yeah, the city of Hartford. I'm a taxpayer in the city of Hartford. My neighbors are taxpayers. Right? Most people in the city of Hartford support it, actually. And that's a fact. And even you want to mention people who opposed it? We can, we can agree to di disagree as we had the debate. The facts are afterwards, those that supported it, we are right. It's a tremendous success. And there's no amount of uh, misusing people's votes or things to say that it's not. And it, well, the, the fortunate thing is it's all, th 30 yeah, seconds, it, it's all out there in, in, in the public record. And you can look it up on Google. Uh, you, you, it's all out there. We, we, it, it, it we, found, we found this all on Google. Right, uh, and, 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 and I'm and, glad and, Google serves your purposes as a public servant well, right? I don't need Google. Uh, I've spent 25 uh, years helping the people in my community and this state. I didn't need to, I didn't decide to run for state treasurer and to go to Google to find out what happened. Uh, all right, I think we're going to move on from this, from this topic. Uh, the next question will be uh, f for you, Mr. Gray. Um, should the state and the treasurer's office be involved in value or virtue-based investing, investing in companies based on things like environmental programs, social impact statements. Um, and in the case of Connecticut, it could mean things like avoiding companies, like maybe defense contractors, gun manufacturers, or tobacco companies that are known for perhaps negative societal environmental impacts. Do you think that that is a kind of investing philosophy that would be a good one for the state's pension funds? I uh, absolutely support socially responsible investing. Um, the, 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 the firm that I was at previously actually signed the uh, United Nations principles on socially responsible investing, and I, I supported our decision to do that. Uh, but I think that every project that you look at has to have a, a return standard, has to go through the same policies and procedures that every other investment goes through. And, and at the end of the day, we can't allow the state treasurer to play politics with the pensioners and the taxpayers' money. So as state treasurer, I will make certain that every investment that we make, that it meets the same return standard and the same risk standard. So I, what, I, what I don't uh, 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 want to see is uh, uh, investments that are made uh, for, for you know, some uh, social or political reason that have lower return potential and higher risk profile than other investments that can be made uh, through the pension system. At the end of the day, the treasurer needs to protect the backs of the pensioners and the taxpayers. It is important to invest in a socially responsible way, as I said earlier, but we have to meet return standards that, that, that provide the security for our retirees uh, because that's all they have to retire on. Mr. Wooden, same question to you. Sure. I think we're, we're witnessing in real time the making of a politician. My opponent has repeatedly answered that question, no, I will only look at the return, the return, the return. And that is by stark contrast to my view, which is, of course, I've advised state treasurers and pension boards uh, for, for 20 years on investments. You have to, as a fiduciary, you have to maximize returns, you have to minimize risk. Um, but I also believe that you have an obligation, right, to reflect the priorities of your state, to reflect the priorities of whose money it is, right? It's beneficiaries, it's taxpayers. And I believe we should absolutely, if you can invest in investment A um, or B, right, and B, has these bad social ills associated with it, absolutely, and get the same risk return profile, absolutely invest in A. Every, every day, all day, right? I've gone on record saying uh, we should divest out of irresponsible gun manufacturers. That's not only based on the fact that they traffic in, in death, um, but it's also based on the fact that their return profile is not as attractive, right? If you keep getting sued, if you spend a lot of money, right? So you have to look at long-term shareholder value, right? And, and socially responsible investing, 
you might not be able to do it with an entire portfolio, or you probably can't, but you can, in fact, get a double bottom line or a triple bottom line. When I talk about investing in our state, that's absolutely uh, what we're talking about. We're saying, yeah, we have to get the right returns. Um, we owe it as a fiduciary to, to our pensioners, right? But we can also try to leverage and advance additional objectives to help people. That's what government and public service is about. Thank you. Mr. Gray, one minute to you if you'd like to respond. Um, well, I mean, once again, I, I, uh, my primary objective as state treasurer is to have the backs of the pensioners and the taxpayers every day. Uh, the, the, the taxpayers and the employees of our public pension plans have, have put their hard money into the pension system. Uh, we have about 220,000 people in this state that depend on those assets for their retirement, and we can't allow ourselves to play political games with that money. Uh, at the same time, I mean, I am a proponent of investing in a socially responsible way, without a question. But the primary emphasis has to be on the returns and the risk and making sure that both are appropriate because people, real people who work every day, need that money for their retirement. Then we're going to move on from this topic. Um, the next question is for, I believe it's for uh, you, Mr. Gray. Mm -hmm. um, should the state... Do you think that the state of Connecticut is going to be able to honor all of its contracts to its existing pensioners, but uh, sorry, existing retirees, but also to the future tire retirees who are currently on tier one and tier two plans? And if not, what's the solution? Uh, well, I, I, I think that we have to uh, uh, honor our, our commitments to our retirees. They've, they've, they've worked their entire lives for the state. It is the only fair thing to do. Um, in terms of the, the current employees, um, I, I think that, you know, one of the ways that, that we can uh, deal with it is that the state is beginning to move more and more towards a hybrid system of uh, a mix between defined benefit and defined contribution. As you know, with defined contribution, uh, the, the state no longer has, has the burden of, of meeting those commitments because it's a portable system. And, and the state puts money in, and then it's, 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 it belongs essentially to, 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 to the employees uh, who, whose, whose 401ks have been funded in that way. Uh, so uh, I, I, I believe that we do absolutely have to honor our commitments to people who've worked their entire lives for our state and have, and have retired. Uh, it, it's an absolute priority to do that. Mr. Wooden? I'm, I'm happy to hear my opponent say that. Unfortunately, Republicans in our state time and time again have talked about not honoring those commitments to retirees with vested benefits. And I totally disagree with that. If, if you work all your life in, you know, based on a promise and you pay into the system, that you should have that in a secure retirement. And so, and I've spent many years focused on pension funds and retirement security. Uh, I'm not quite sure which Republican uh, uh, candidates he's referring to. The, the, I, I, you know, I, uh, I haven't seen that as a platform of the, of the, of, of the Republican Party uh, in this election. It, it's, it's, it's come up, and I understand you haven't been here. You I have been here, you actually. Haven't been, you haven't been engaged in uh, public life I've been life running for this longer than you have, so maybe I've no, been more engaged. No, you've been running for it, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean being engaged. Running for office is just a small part of it. It's public service. Uh, and being engaged. If, if we can move on, I have the next question for you, Ms. Mr. Wooden. Um, Governor Dan Malloy has fully funded the state's pensions every year he's been in office, the actuarial, that ARC payment as it's known. If the next governor, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, or the next General Assembly, looks at the state's fiscal crisis and says, we can reduce that payment, which means that you're kicking that payment off to future generations, what kind of response would you have to the General Assembly or to the governor um, as what kind of message that sends to the different people who hold the state's debt? Well, I think as treasurer, as the principal fiduciary for our retirement system, I would have a responsibility to be one of the loudest voices to oppose that and to say the fiscally responsible thing to do for preserving the system at a minimum, right, at a minimum, and this won't even fix the, the deep hole we're in, at a minimum, is to make that annual actuarially determined contribution amount payment, right? And this is not rhetoric for me. This is something that I have a record of actually standing up and doing 
in a financially strapped city uh, when it's easy, it's easy to ignore a pension system. Um, that's why cities and states throughout this country get into the trouble that they're in. Um, but I have that history, I have that record, and I will be that voice. Uh, Mr. Gray, the General Assembly, who, who you would, in all the cases, be meeting these folks for the first time, uh, they say, look, Treasurer Gray, we think that this is a really good way to free up some extra cash so we can pay for some other programs or whatever it is they want to pay for in General Assembly or the next governor. What do you say to them about fully funding the ARC, that actuarial payment? So um, I, I firmly believe that we just, we really have to stop kicking the can down the road, which is how we got in this trouble to begin with. Uh, we've been, we've really been kicking the can down the road really since, uh, since our pension systems were created back in the late 1930s. Uh, and um, so I, I, I would make a priority of, of fully funding, uh, fully funding the ARC. Uh, one of the, um, uh, you know, one of the uh, issues that we face is that we've, you know, we've recently had an extension of the ARC payments for the state employees fund. Uh, there is some talk on the campaign trail about extending that further. Um, I would I would not favor that. I would not favor that. How do you feel about uh, same question to you? I'll, I'll take give you as well. How do you feel about early payments negotiated um, uh, buyouts? Are you talking about buyouts? buyouts sorry, negotiated yeah. buyouts yeah. for certain groups of retirees on a voluntary basis. I think it's actually a very good idea. Um, uh, a very good idea. Um, you can't enforce it, but but people who want to take their cash up front. Uh, and or maybe roll it into a defined contribution plan. That would probably be the best solution. I've seen some proposals uh, that uh, suggest that we could could do that. I'd, I'd be in favor of that. Um, actually, you could probably finance it because the cost of borrowing the money that you would use to do the buyouts would actually be quite a bit lower than the the actuarial assumptions on, on the money you're buying out. So I think there's a way to finesse that that could be pretty interesting, and, and I, I w would definitely want to explore that as state treasurer. Mr. Wooden, how would you feel about certain buyouts for perhaps certain groups of employees under certain, certain, certain yeah, circumstances? I, I, I would agree on a, on a voluntary basis. I would be very concerned about the notion of financing it, right? And I, and I don't think the assumed rate of return uh, is the measuring stick, right? Because all of us in this space know that many of the assumed rates of returns are too high, right? They don't reflect the reality of what a fund is going to generate. Um, what do you think? I know that the treasurer does not necessarily have that in the room role when it comes to a union negotiation, but those benefits are the things that you guys need to come up with ways to ensure that there's money going to pay for all those things. Uh, this is first que uh, this question be for, for you, Mr. Wooden. What do you make of the current CBAC agreement with all the state employees? And what role do you think the state treasurer has in the future discussion about what those benefit packages may look like with the state's public labor unions? Sure. Um, so I believe in collective bargaining. I believe strongly in it right, and the, the right for workers to organize collectively to have a voice in their negotiations, right? So before we get to what role does the treasurer have in it, because as you point out, the treasurer doesn't right. have a role in it, um, and the legislature has a limited role right. in it, right? So before we even get to the treasurer, we have to talk about, about the legislative role, right? Because ultimately, they have, they have to vote to approve or not approve kind of the negotiated labor agreements. Um, as a fiduciary, do you think that the treasurer has to say something publicly regarding a conversation like that that happens because you're talking about billions of dollars and benefits that affect tens of thousands of people in the state? I think, I th I think the treasurer should engage, right, on, even if you don't have a, vo a vote, yeah. you, you have a voice, right, and you have expertise, um, individual expertise, and a cadre of experts in various disciplines, right? And I think you should work constructively uh, with a governor, uh, with a legislature, irrespective of a party, yeah. right? To be, bring the best ideas to bear, to let people who uh, impact uh, what is within your purview to control, to let them know the effects of their decisions. Mr. Gray, your, your role in this? Well, once again, I mean, the, the Treasurer has uh, direct and indirect responsibilities in, in, in their position in office. And to be the, the fiscal conscience of, of the state, uh, to, 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 to have a bully pulpit on all these kinds of issues, I think, is, is tremendously important. 
Uh, and um, I, I, what I'm concerned about is that the, the, the way that the collective bargaining process works in, in the state at the moment, a lot of it happens really you know, without input from the legislature. And we have elected officials in the state who, who, who really should have, have, have more of a voice in, in, in the process of structuring these labor agreements, in my opinion. A uh, question for you is actually one of our last questions of the debate. I got an email, uh, as a matter of fact, right before we were coming on, on the set from a state employee who said he feels like he has kind of been a target in a lot of ways over years. He said, to the point that both of you have made during this debate, this is not a problem of the last decade. It's a problem of the last seven decades. Um, Question for you, Mr. Gray. What's your message to state employees in one minute? What's your message to state employees about the way you view their pensions and the way you view their benefits and their role in the overall state government picture? Well, I mean, I think that the, the, the most direct impact the treasurer has is, is protecting the retirement security of all the state employees uh, uh, as, as a steward of, 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 of the investments that, that we're making. That's, that's the, the primary role that, that I would be playing. And I would say to, to the state employees, I, I'm going to have your backs every day in making those investments. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, I, I'm going to be your watchdog to make sure that your investments uh, are, are safe and, and that the returns from our pension system improve from where they are right now. Uh, as I said earlier, we are now ranked sort of it, towards the bottom quartile or the bottom 25 percent of pension funds around the, the country in terms of our investment returns. That's the number one thing I want to change uh, when I get into office is to, to, to bring us back to respectability in terms of those returns. Mr. Wooden, your message to state employees, your role as treasurer. My, my message is, is that I'm going to look out for every taxpayer in this state, and that includes our state workforce and our state workers. I'm going to have your back, not because I'm running in a campaign, and I'm going to make an empty promise of having your back when the other members of the Republican Party don't, right? I'm going to have your back because, because I have, right? And I believe in retirement security. I've focused on it, and that's the work that I've done. Workers have been scapegoats. Right for failed leadership, and and I do believe that. Right, you come back to the city of Hartford. Right, I I supported eliminating uh, the embers, the gold-plated insurance program for senior officials, elected officials, directors, and deputy directors. Work five years, and you get life benefits for health, uh, life benefits, uh, health benefits for life. Right, I eliminated that. Right, so we, we focus a lot on, on workers, and some do, and make them the scapegoat. But um, I will not make workers the scapegoat. I will make them my partners in shared sacrifice and solutions. It is now time for our closing statements. Right. Uh, to, uh, to you, Mr. Wooden, you have one minute. Thank you. Um, so tonight, we've heard from two very different candidates with two very different backgrounds and two very different visions for the future of Connecticut. My life's journey, uh, coming from struggle in the north end of Hartford to a very successful private sector career to public service, has defined who I am. It explains why I will fight so hard for working families to get ahead in our state. The truth is, you've heard a lot tonight about uh, the city of Hartford. The truth is that it's easy, if you're born on the right side of the tracks, to sit in a penthouse on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan to help the rich get richer, to support Donald Trump and his policies, and to say, I want to make Connecticut great again. That's easy. Rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work of government, as I have done in public service, um, that's less easy. Having a successful career representing public pension funds and their investments, that's my record. Thank, thank as you. treasurer, I will continue to maximize returns and invest in the future of our state. Thank you, Mr. Wooden. Mr. Gray, one minute to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, on November 6th, uh, voters have, uh, have a clear choice uh, between uh, someone uh, who represents the entrenched guard that is all politics or someone that has the leadership skills uh, to be the fiscal conscience of our state. When I was growing up, uh, my father taught me an important lesson which I carry with me to this day. He said, if you do two things in life, you'll do just fine. 
speak your mind, and keep your word. As I've crossed the four corners of our state uh, uh, talking to voters about Connecticut's issues, I have spoken my mind about our unfunded pension liabilities, about the unfair Hartford bailout, and about the subpar investment returns from our pension assets. And if you elect me as your state treasurer on November 6th, I will keep my word. To the teachers, to the public safety workers, to the other retirees, and to the taxpayers, <clears throat> I will have your backs every day. I will stand up to bureaucrats in Hartford. I will protect your hard-earned money. All right, thank you very much. That is all for our Decision 2018 State Treasurer Debate. Make sure to join us on NBC Connecticut News at 11 for a recap of tonight's debate. We also invite you to tune in to Face the Facts with me, Max Reese, airing this Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Thank you to our candidates, both Sean Wooden and, and to Thad thank Gray. Thank you for joining us. I'm Max Reese, NBC Connecticut. Good night.